Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, welcome to this episode. Today joining me is Eric Myers, who is the owner at Myers Mushrooms in Wichita, Kansas. Eric is currently serving his country as a vehicle mechanic in the United States Air Force, but loves mushroom cultivation. He built a successful mushroom business in El Paso, Texas, sold it, and then moved to Wichita, Kansas, where he is building a new operation. He also sells mushroom supplies through his website. Welcome to the podcast, Eric. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah. So uh, thank you first for your service to our country. Um, I know that's, uh, it's never fun to be away from home and away from your family, but uh, we definitely appreciate the, uh, your commitment to the, to the idea you. of freedom, I guess is what yeah. I'm saying. Because thank you. I think we in the U.S. take it way too much for granted. Yeah, I'm, it's, uh, it's not easy being out here, that's for sure. Being away from the family and uh, my whole life, you know, I'm separated out here. So it, it kind of, it stinks, you know, yeah. but uh, that's, that's the military life. And uh, I've been doing it for 13 years now. Wow. So, wow. Yep. So talk to us a little bit about your background. How did you get started with farming and, and then into mushrooms? Um, so I've always been a tinker um, and I always kind of built stuff and loved you know, working with my hands and building all kinds of everything. Um, and I'm a mechanic for the Air Force. That's what I do full time. And then uh, I kind of had a green thumb growing up. My mother, you know, encouraged me to get in the garden and I was always, you know, growing things. And then uh, I went to El Paso in 2015. And when I got there, I kind of wanted to have a hobby that was more productive in a sense of, of making money. Uh-huh. So I looked into different options of you know, how can I make uh, a decent amount of money in a small space? Because I only had a, a one car garage at the time. Yeah. And I started looking around at like different methods of farming and, you know, a lot of them need more space. And I, I realized that uh, mushrooms, you can get, you know, pounds per square foot per week. So yeah. I, I was looking into that and uh, I started, I started growing mushrooms in my one car garage on base, which is not advisable, but, you know, it's <laughs> away. But uh, so I started doing that. And, and the thing that I noticed that there was nobody doing it in El Paso. So I had uh-huh. the whole market. Um, and then, and yeah, so I just took off from there. Very cool. So yep. then how many years did you run that before you sold that operation? So I was there for four years. Um, I got that into it. I got that same operation into a two car garage. We ended up buying a house um, on the other side of town and ran that for four years. And then um, I sold that a couple months before I left to Andre Gutierrez, who's still running Myers Mushrooms El Paso. Oh, very cool. Um, yeah, so he kept the name and all that, yeah. And what would you say, did you mean to build something to sell or was it just kind of like you were moving and there was a great opportunity, so you just decided to sell? So I knew that I was gonna leave there. We had, a, it was a controlled tour. Uh, uh-huh. So it was, it was a four year, de- not deployment, but it was a four year uh, uh, assignment. Yeah. So I knew that I was leaving there uh, last year, you know, so, so I kind of, one part of it was I built it with a sense of moving to, to begin with, cause I was in the one car garage yep. on base and I knew that I was going to move, move the grow room. And then um, that just, you know, easily trailed into moving it to the new location um, when I did sell it. So it wasn't really made with an intention to sell, but, I kind of was in the back of my mind the, the whole time that, you know, I, I could sell this operation and, and more important than the operation is selling the actual clients and, and the training, you know, yes. that's the biggest part of it. So, yeah, you're selling a business system that basically at, makes money and makes a return on the investment that the person has into that business. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, it's blooming right now. He's doing really well. Um, you know, the, the operation is better than it ever could have been because we, we built it, um, the way I should have from the beginning, you know, mm-hmm. it was a, basically the third time I built the same grow. So it was better in, in every way. And uh, he's pushing over a hundred pounds per week out of a two car garage, which is you know, wow. awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. 
Now, when you are set up on you know farming with the grow, what does a typical day look like for you? Um, so currently, yeah, we're still under, we're, we're finishing up construction, but on the production end of it, uh, typically you're going to have the bagging, lab, bagging is, you know, filling the bags and folding them and loading them into the sterilizer. And then you have the lab work. Yep. And then you have putting the, the bags that have been colonizing for, you know, two to 10 weeks into fruiting and cleaning the fruiting room and, and harvesting. And then the other okay. part of it is, is doing sales. But um, every day you're harvesting. Every single day you're harvesting, and, and uh, once a week or more, you're going to be rotating bags and, and doing lab work. So it's it's a weekly schedule of pretty much doing the same thing over and over with a little bit of variation, not a whole lot. Gotcha. Yep. Now, how long after you harvest the mushrooms can they hold before you sell them? So um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it depends on the species. So like say king oysters or shiitakes they might be good for like two weeks and they'll still look fine but uh some other varieties like uh say golden oysters or, or yep. uh, pink oysters they have a very short shelf life and they, they have to be sold within days that's why i don't really like to grow those varieties i'll grow more of the gray oyster or uh -huh. elm oyster that that have a longer shelf life um so yeah it depends on the on the species really but typically you want to get it to the chef or the client within a matter of three to seven days at the most, that's really pushing it with seven days because at that point they start to split and they start to grow out to where mm -hmm. the, the mycelium will grow out from the, the stems and it doesn't look as appealing. So, oh, so they're actually kind of like just blow apart the mushrooms and grow out so they can, fr is that where they're just going to release spores or? So um, they are still alive. So what happens is that a lot of times the stems will start to uh, grow mycelium out, like trying to reach out for new substrate. So ah. they, they get all fuzzy looking on the stems when they've been stored for a long time. Sometimes they'll even fruit. If you leave them for long enough, the, the fruit bodies will actually put out new fruits. Uh, but that's, that's really, you know, when you're two or three weeks old, that's yeah, like when you should have thrown it out. Yeah. So, they're scrambling to get out the next generation of mushrooms. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. So, so what do you feel are the missed opportunities in your industry right now? Because I know mushrooms are right now, I mean, they're hot. They're huge. There's a, a yep. 20,000 person group, Facebook group. Um, yep. What's the opportunities? The opportunities, I mean, there, there are definitely some untapped markets out there, um, depending on where you're at. at. At the same time, some markets are, are saturated. Okay. Um, so like the, the, the West Coast, from what I understand, is very saturated. Yeah. But there's definitely some cities in the Midwest that, that don't have mushroom farms or only have a couple small mushroom farms, there's yeah. still plenty of opportunity for, for mushroom farmers out there to, to start, start a new operation or, or scale up and all that. But um, yeah, it's a growing industry for sure. Um, and I think it's going to get bigger with, with time. Absolutely. I mean, the, with education of, of the, uh, of the, the public and the restaurants and the chefs and all that, I think that learning about these gourmet mushrooms that it'll definitely grow the entire industry bigger and i think that there's lots of potential now are people just selling them fresh or people also drying them what are value added products people can do with mushrooms uh probably the the leading value added product that i've seen um would be the mushroom jerky for like oh, interesting. mushrooms they'll they'll uh cook them and dehydrate them with with marinades and everything that's doing that's take, taken off pretty well a couple people that i know are actually getting that certified to where it's um a product that is certified to be, you know, uh, shelf stable and all that through the yep. local ag departments. So there are a couple of people working on that, that I've seen, including um, Andre and Myers Motions El Paso. He, he has one going through right now. And um, what else? Uh, the other thing is tinctures. So tinctures would be more for your medicinal, like reishi, lion's mane, uh -huh. um, shiitake, and you would dehydrate them and then powder them and extract all the chemicals out of it and have it in a little tincture bottle. And that's a really good value added item that has a long shelf life and uh, medicinal qualities. And it's, it's small, you know, like you can yeah. have a, a small briefcase can hold a, a, you know, hundreds of these bottles that are worth five to $20 each. So it, yes. it's um, like when I went to a mushroom festival, that's what I brought with a bunch of them to sell because it was a compact item that I could take and, yeah. and sell a lot of. Are people mixing the, you know, some of those specialty tinctures with like CBD? Um, I don't know. I don't, I'm not, 
I'm not allowed to do CBD. I don't really look into that too much. I'm not sure. So gotcha. I'm, I'm sure if you wanted to, you could. I don't know what the benefits of it were would be, but yeah. 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 So let's talk a little bit about low tech outdoor mushrooms. Um, I saw you do a post about that. I think it was about the strafaria. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do, I've done a lot of logs. Uh, okay. I'm familiar with King Strafaria. I, I want to try to make some, uh, some beds. I have that and blew it, um, spore prints that I actually got. I had a couple people cause you can, you can grow by culture where yep. you have spawn or a Petri dish, or you can grow by, um, uh, the, spore print. So I had a couple people send me the spore prints to where I'm going to take that and put it onto agar and grow it out of uh, strafaria and blew it. And I'm going to try to play with those um, in, in the woods. I, I sit next to a hundred acre farm and they have a, a big wooded area between me and the farm. And he's already given me clearance to go ahead and, and have fun in there. So I'm going to, I'm going to be inoculating up some beds. Um, and basically what you do is you would, you'd take, uh, you know, bags and bags of this the sawdust that's already colonized and then lay it out in layers like lasagna yep. with mulch and manures and all that hay and whatever and they'll colonize and and keep growing year after year especially if you keep top feeding it more mulch and more manures uh, but what i have been doing so that's my in my plans for this year and next year i'm going to start doing that what i have been doing when i go home to new york where my my parents and my my brother lives i've been doing uh totems and all okay. that is, is just oak logs or hardwood logs. Um, basically anything that's not a pine works for the most part. Yep. And um, you, you just chainsaw them. You cut, you cut them into slices and then you stack them just where you have, you know, maybe a, a 10 inch log with a, a little bit of sawdust spawn and then another 10 inch log and then sawdust spawn. You keep going like that. Um, and my parents, I mean, my mom was saying she was getting like five to seven pounds a week. Oh my in the gosh. spring and the fall like she did she was giving them away like you know tons of mushrooms and if you've ever seen you know seven yeah. pounds of mushrooms is a whole tray full yes. like a, you deliver it to a restaurant so yeah. um yeah she was uh she was loving that and i just set my brother up with a bigger setup um uh, which was low tech but a little bit um automated to where yep. we, we we did a single zone um sprinkler system yep. with yep. little pop-up heads and you know kept it pretty basic that way he can kick it on on a timer so he doesn't have to worry about it too much and and still make sure the logs don't dry out because that's one of the issues is you know yeah. if drought the logs will dry out so um by sprinkling the area and getting the logs wet it helps hydrate um the logs and keep the humidity up in the area for any fruits that are fruiting interesting now do you have to like coat the sawdust areas with like uh wax to keep them wet or just keep them wet from the sprinkler so for totems, you don't. Totems, you don't need to do any kind of wax or anything like that. If you were doing inoculation of a log where you drill holes yeah. and, then, and then shove in either dowels or sawdust spawn with a little injection tool, um, yes, those you would typically put some kind of cheese wax or beeswax or some kind of wax over the holes um, to keep bugs from eating it out and keep uh, birds from picking it out too. Yeah. But, um, but for the totems, because they're they're so big, you just you just layer it in there, and it usually colonizes within a week to where you can even pick up the top log and it will pick up the whole stack because oh, it wow. fuses them together. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you, you don't have to to use any kind of waxes or anything like that. Is there a size limit to the size of logs you can use? So if you're doing the like lo inoculating logs with yeah, you know, the drilling and and all that, you're you're talking anywhere from like four to maybe six inches, maybe eight at the most. But yep. totems, they can go big. I mean, the bigger you go with a totem, uh, the longer it's going to last. So if you have oh, an old two-foot two stump that you want to inoculate, uh, as long as you can manhandle that sucker around and, and build it, then yeah. go at it. So it, it'll just last a lot longer because there's, there's more mass to it, and it's going to take longer for the mushrooms to, to eat through it and turn it yeah. all into uh, you know, mush over the years. Interesting. Fascinating. Yep. Could you actually put this, uh, basically cut a tree down, block it up and then stack it right back on its stump or will that actually have them start? No, you could, you definitely could. And then the other, the other uh, benefit of if the roots are still in the ground is you have a wicking effect yeah. as long as it doesn't start growing out. You know, sometimes you cut a tree down and it'll start, suckers yeah. will stop popping up. But yeah. um, it, if, as long as it doesn't grow out, you actually, the, the roots will rot and then it'll wick 
the moisture out of the ground, which will feed the mushroom. So it's, it can actually be beneficial to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. So I have friends that do uh, pork in the woods and sometimes they're thinning for that. And I'm wondering if you could, if you obviously want to cut the stump tall enough so that the pigs mm -hmm. couldn't get to the mushrooms and wouldn't cause, you know, food safety issues. But mm -hmm. that could be interesting because they're only in there usually for a couple weeks out of the entire year. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, always trying to think about something new. <laughs> <laughs> How to apply uh, things. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Fascinating. So let's talk about just management of the, the, the uh, business. Um, there's mm -hmm. always endless tasks to be done. As, but I feel like a mushroom operation has more like set tasks. It's not like you're not dealing with as much weather, let's say, as you're like outside farming, correct? Absolutely, yeah. It's much more of a weekly routine. Um, and then you have you know your monthly interval maintenance. A, a lot of it is... Um, just keeping everything up to where the the equipment needs to be, you know, air conditioners need to be cleaned, your fans need to be cleaned, your mister nozzles need to be cleaned. Yeah, um, a lot of a lot of cleaning, a lot of cleaning, especially with mushrooms, because if if you don't clean and you have some kind of trichoderma, like the green um, mold breakout or any kind of disease in your fruiting room, it can be really bad. Mm. So um, cleanliness is is very important with mushroom cultivation, especially in the laboratory too, where you know, if you're not sweeping up at the end of the day um, after your lab session, well, now you have substrate on the floor. That's going to possibly be a, a vector yeah. for contaminations to grow or even mice, you know, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, um, you run into that issue too. But um, yeah, you just got to be in that weekly grind kind of thing. And, and there, there is a little bit of seasonal. We do yeah. have a little bit of seasonal in the fact of um, in the wintertime, you can run your fruiting room in the 50s and grow like the harder to grow or cooler weather uh, mushrooms like king oyster or maitake and then in the summertime you might not grow them because you don't want to pay the air condition down to 50 degrees um, when you're blowing it all out the window because the the fact we got to keep the co2 down so yes yes fruiting room is always having an exhaust blowing outside and it gets really expensive when you're you're trying to cool down to the 50s so that that's the most seasonal variables that we really get is is we might grow certain species during certain seasons because it, it favors the, the fruiting temperatures. Interesting. Um, yeah. But e even still, you don't want to get the fruiting room you know, anywhere above like 65, 70, 70 is really pushing it because anything above that, um, your product quality isn't as good. And then also the shelf life isn't as good. Yeah. So people that are growing outside, cause I've seen people try some of these stuff outside in the summer, they're just mm -hmm. not going to have the quality stuff just won't fruit. Well, there's bugs. Um, yeah. Your, the bugs is one of the big ones. And then also you're, you're, you know, a slave to the, to the weather. So yes, you can build a microclimate, you can do shade cloth, you can do overhead misters and all of that. Um, but at the end of the day, if it's freezing cold outside, they're not going to grow. Or if it's 110 degrees outside, they're just going to be, they're going to grow so fast that they're going to over ripen with the yeah. blink of an eye and you're, and you're going to miss the, the prime point to pick them. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be almost like asparagus with the harvest four times a day. Exactly, exactly. I want to say like Callow, he's he, um, when it's really hot out, he does have to harvest multiple times a day. So interesting. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what um, systems did you set up? Did you have like SOPs or stuff like that? I mean, when you were you operating by yourself, or did you have people helping you with the operation? So it started out with just me in El Paso. And then I ended up getting a, a, a deal with one of my, um, I spoke at one of the, the, the university there and, and then she hooked me up with some, some students that were helping out. So yeah. I started to have, that was like the first of me having like workers, you know, um, and that was in El Paso. And then after training up Andre and, and Sergio, that was working with them a little bit. I got a little bit more experience working with them. And then coming to Wichita, my biggest learning experience with working with, with uh, the crew was I was running a construction crew for six months. That's what it really was. It was, I, I would get off of work and, and run a construction crew building this whole operation out. Um, but once, once that was all done and we started to get into the groove, you know, it, it, uh, we, we just barely started to actually start producing mushrooms towards the end. But um, yeah, it was, it was a challenge. It was a big challenge learning how to, to run the crew, how yeah. to dish out tasks. And, and a lot of this is like, it was the first time that I did a lot of it. It wasn't, yeah. I've, I've never installed a mini split before. I've never epoxied yeah. floors or framed out a building. 
So it wasn't just um, uh, picking the expert. It was who do I think knows a little bit more than the other person to do X, Y, Z, or yeah. given that task, you know, but um, it, so far the, the operation is looking awesome. We're like 90% done with it and uh, should be finishing it up when I get back and, and going full steam. But uh, yeah, it's cool. been a, it's been a learning lesson for sure. Running the crew. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you say the hardest thing that you've ever done as, you know, at running in business for yourself as being a mushroom farmer? Um, talk to us about that. Um, the hardest thing, uh, I would say it's probably been building this operation out. It's just yeah. been, it's been never ending, you know, deadlines not met and, and, you know, they're just deadlines that I made, but yeah. so I was, I was hoping to take three or four months and, and six months later, it was still, we're still working till midnight. Um, but that was probably the biggest, uh, hurdle was just things taking way too long and it, it's just cause you know, you want to do it right. It, it's either yeah. hack it or do it the right way and take a little bit longer. So we, uh, we, we took the long route, you know? Yeah. What will be the capacity when it's done? Um, so the, the operation is a split operation. The whole it's, it's 2,400 square feet, 1200 of it is for fresh mushroom production. Okay. I have a, I have a 270 square foot fruiting room. Incubation is around, uh, 440 square feet. So the incubation is twice as big as the fruiting room. I should be able to do uh, single flush bags where the, the bags go in, give a harvest, get out. Um, with that uh, strategy, I should be able to push like four to 500 pounds a week out of it okay. um, at full capacity. And then if needed, I can always expand. I can always, I have the backside of the building. I can put a shipping container back there if I need to expand fruiting or yeah. incubation. And there's even a back lot. So I'm, I'm looking at buying the lot behind me, which is vacant um, with potential to expand to that if needed. Um, and then on top of that, so I said it was a split. So the other half of it is a spawn operation. So I'm starting to build, um, I'm, I'm going to finish up my spawn lab when I get back and I'll be have, a, I'll have a capacity of about uh, 160 spawn bags a day. Oh, wow. Um, production. So it, it should be, and that's if I'm going full time, but I'd have to, I'd basically have to quit my job to, to do that. Yeah. Um, but uh, we're, we're shooting for, to probably shoot, shoot for about 120 bags a week uh, and, and go from there. And that should be able to, man hopefully be able to manage that while I'm still working for the Air Force. Yeah. Um, and, and that'll be shipping nationwide, supplying farmers, you know, everywhere. Yeah. So. so walk us through a little bit of that spawn process, because I know some people say we well, can do it yourself, but I also see okay. people sell a lot of it online. Mm -hmm. I bought obviously mine online when I got started here a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. um, do people just not like the, the detail about it? So um, spawn, the, the one of the things with spawn is that it's a whole different, a whole different production. You know, yeah. if, if you are, if you are just growing mushrooms and you're a mushroom farmer, a lot of the biggest mushroom farms don't even make their own spawn. Like for instance, um, interesting Monterey mushrooms, which yep. is, they have, they have one in, in, uh, in Madisonville, they have Amicil. So Amicil is like the sister company to Monterey. Amicil is a separate building, separate company, like across the street from them that makes spawn and they give the spawn to Monterey mushrooms. It's just a completely different level of cleanliness. Um, uh, sure. Anybody can make spawn in their kitchen, but it's not going to be 99.9% .9 reliable, you know, or it's not yeah. going to have the correct moisture content to where it might look good. But when you go to spawn it, half of this, the uh, inoculation points die off, which uh. is, is common, especially with like millet, which is very small compared to like Milo, um, yeah. which is sorghum. So yeah. So where, when you get the really good spawn, like let's say you order like Anisil spawn, um, they make, they make an oyster mushroom, uh, was it 3015? That spawn is, is some of the best spawn on earth because they have their, their science is down and they have like a top level clean room. Yeah. Meanwhile, you can go, go to Etsy or whatever, eBay and buy <laughs> some spawn and it's going to be questionable in the fact of, are you sure that that culture is what it, they're selling it as? Um, is it clean? Yeah. Is the moisture content right? Is the vigor good? Is it going to actually pop off like it should? Or are you going to have to use twice as much spawn then to get the same effect? Yeah. So that that's the difference with spawn is, is it's it's a whole different ball game when it comes to to mushroom production and with with your daily schedule 
if you're just going to go in and, and just make, make uh, sawdust bags, that's one production line. And then making spawn is a whole separate production line that you have gotcha. to do cultures, agar plates. You got to make sure you're keeping them fresh because you can't just pull an old culture out that's three months old and make spawn with it. You got to make a fresh one that's growing out new so you can watch it to make sure yeah. that it's clean and then inoculate. So then you got to soak, you got to soak your grains. You got to use different bags typically because most people are growing in 10 pound bags and, and you don't really want 10 pounds of spawn. So you got, you got different bags on hand and you really want to pressure cook your spawn. Yeah. Um, whereas a lot of people are just atmospheric sterilizing their, their sawdust bags. So yes. It's just a lot of, it's a whole different beast. It really is. It's a whole different beast. Gotcha. So the takeaway is don't buy your spawn off eBay or Etsy. Don't buy your spawn off eBay, eBay or Etsy. Um, Northspore.com. You can use promo Myers mushrooms, and they give you 10% off. Northspore has been in the business for a long time. I don't know. I should know the date, but they've been gotcha. in it for a while, and uh, they're a reliable spawn provider. They they've been providing me spawn for a while, so they're legit. Awesome. And the other thing I see on the group once in a while, someone says, "Hey, I got mushroom seeds from China." And oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so mushroom seeds is not a thing. They don't have seeds. <laughs> A lot of times, uh, you know, it's just some scammy, scammy yep. dude from Russia or China that wants to make a buck. And, uh, yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very funny to me that people would actually fall for that. But Yeah, and, you know, it's because it's they, don't, they don't do the research first. They just um, they go, hey, I want to grow mushrooms. Let me get some mushroom seeds. And, and uh, that's not how we do it. So the, the best way is to get, get some spawn or even get a grow kit. You know, that's, that's probably yeah. the best way if you want to get started is, is go online and order uh, a fruiting kit. North Spore sells them too, where it's just a sawdust block yep. that's, that's ready to fruit and you just cut it open. And that's what I started with, a, a fruiting kit. And um, when I got that, I had intentions of, of cultivating it out and propagating it out. So before I fruited it, I transferred it onto some grain and, and yep. did, a, did a grain to grain transfer to make more spawn out of it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a good way to get started and it's a quicker result. Uh, you're more likely to actually get mushrooms out of it than then starting mm -hmm. from scratch and, and doing everything, um, you know, to where you're, you're doing it from the, the beginning, start okay. with the kit and then go from there. Absolutely. So let's talk about you're getting started in the mushroom business. Who are your mentors? Uh, I'd say TR Davis is probably earth angel mushrooms. Yep. He's a, uh, he's one of my biggest mentors. Uh, he's the, the one mushroom farmer that I've hung out with the most. I've, I visited his farm probably like four or five times now and stayed, stayed for a couple days usually. Um, and he's, he's really showed me, you know, the, the biggest thing is to, to always think big. Yeah. Don't, don't limit yourself. Um, you know, that's kind of why, like now I'm selling nationwide. I'm selling to all of uh, North America with the bags and, and yeah. my equipment and all that. So it's, uh, you know, always think big. And, and he's been a big, uh, just mentor for me. And he's, he's a cool guy. He's an ex Marine. So we got the, the veteran thing going yeah. for both of us, you know, and, and, and we just click really well. So good dude. One of my, one of my best friends too. Great guy. Very so. cool. So you're right now you're building out your new mushroom grow. Talk to us about kind of the things that you're doing different with this one. Cause you said you've done it now multiple times. Uh, yeah. So I've done it, done it a couple of times. The biggest thing um, with this one is that it's bigger. So, not a two car garage. Yeah. So, uh, usually space, you know, space constrictions are, are paying the butt. Um, and then this time I'm building it, you know, from the ground up. So I, I did all the electrical, how, how it should be no more running extension cords from here to there. Yep. And, um, and I zoned it all out with, with proper mini splits. So I have, you know, one ton in the lab, a two ton in the fruiting, a ton and a half, uh, you know, everything's how it should be when it comes yeah. for, for zoning it out. So I have, proper climate control and that's really important when it comes to to cultivating mushrooms to have proper climate control and airflow and all that circulation um and then what else just just bigger i mean this is way bigger and then i'm also i'm also uh for the first time i'm going to be running an actual autoclave so i have a, a two foot by three foot by four foot that's the in inside dimensions of the chamber oh wow autoclave and it's double door too. So I have that and a 15 horsepower boiler, which is uh, 600,000 BTUs. So Ooh. I got, I got that and I'll be firing those up hopefully this summer. Um, and that'll be my first time running an autoclave, which will be very interesting. So 
that's a big uh, a big advancement for for my practices, and that should that'll that'll be for the spawn, is what that is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it'll it'll be it'll be interesting to get it all up and running. That's for sure. It's going to be a lot bigger, a lot more mushrooms, a lot more work. So I definitely have to get some employees this time. Yeah, uh, without a doubt. Um, but it should be interesting. Yeah. Now, one thing you mentioned a little bit ago was like a shipping container. Do you see people mm -hmm. using those a lot? Yeah, there's there's a lot of growers that use shipping containers. The uh, the reefer ones are the best because they're already insulated. Yes. Um, yeah, so reefer container and, you know, just throw some air conditioning in there, throw some racks in there and, and go to town. Um, a lot of people just use them for fruiting. I've I've looked at doing like some people were saying, were asking me, how would you, you know, build a whole fruiting operation in one, in one container? They're really not big enough, truthfully. You'd really want to have at least two, two 40 footers. Yeah. If you ask me, cause it's just, there's too many different zones. Yeah. Um, between lad and bagging and fruiting. So yeah, if you could get two of them, you can absolutely have a decent size operation. I mean, two, two of them would be about, I think it's around 400 square feet, which is yeah. right around the minimum that I would recommend for a, uh, you know, small commercial operation, anything smaller than that, and you're really cramped. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then obviously you just want fresh air intake as well to uh, make sure the for CO2, yeah. Yeah, for the fruiting, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So the other thing I meant, I heard from somebody else about mushrooms I was talking to, um, I think we both know him, Adam, was just talking about how to make, make sure that you're not breathing the spores. Yeah, so um, you want to wear a respirator. You want to wear a P100 respirator um and that'll that'll capture everything around like 0.3 microns or smaller or i'm sorry 0.3 microns or bigger um which are the spores i think they're around 0.5 microns yep depends on the species but um yeah so you want to wear a respirator in there um the other issue that i run into more so than than the, the mushroom spores is dealing with the powder of the substrate so you're dumping all these pelletized materials these sawdust uh -huh. Yeah. And that fine dust, you know, it, it gets uh, irritating on your, in your lungs and on your skin and all of that. So especially hay or straw rather working yeah. with straw is, is pretty gross stuff. So um, yeah, you want to wear a respirator whenever you're dealing with the powders like bagging, or if you are in the fruiting room for a prolonged time. Now, if, if I go in there really quick and just I'm working for a minute or two, that's one thing. But yeah. if I go in there and I'm harvesting for a half hour or an hour, yeah, um, you definitely want to get a mask on there. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yep. All right. With that, I'd like to stop here and take a quick break. In a minute, we'll be okay. back with Eric Myers from Myers Mushrooms. Special thanks to our podcast sponsor, Localine, for supporting the Thriving Farmer podcast. Localine is an easy-to-use e-commerce platform for farmers to build a website, sell online, and save time in order tracking and delivery. When we tried to sell online with our farm, it was so hard. And we even had a week where a mistyped email was sending orders out into cyberspace and resulted in very frustrated customers and a very late night for me in the wash and pack shed. With Localine, everyone is happy. Easy ordering interface for the customer. Robust back-end that has all the features I always wanted in a farmer-oriented e-commerce platform, such as charge when the product ships, no tracking refunds on scraps of paper, easy ordering deadlines and drop location integration, and so much more. I was really blown away when I went through the platform. This week, they're offering Thriving Farmer podcast listeners a free premium feature valued at $300. Two of my favorite premium features are Advanced Inventory. With Advanced Inventory, this allows you to get really specific about the products you're offering and create multiple packaging and pricing options. The other premium feature I love is their QuickBooks integration. The dreaded tax season is rapidly approaching. With a local line QuickBooks integration, you can rest assured that everything is in one place and you don't need to drown in loose leaf paperwork and sticky notes when you go to file. Plus, no one loves entering information twice. I love the once and done aspect of this one. To learn more and claim your free premium feature, you need to register at growingfarmers.localline.us. Even if you're not ready today, by registering at growingfarmers.localline.us, you can always come back and claim this offer, plus grab their free website designer today. All right, we are back with Eric Myers from Myers Mushrooms. Eric, tell us a little bit about your marketing. When you were running the mushroom farm in El Paso, how did you get in touch with your customers? Um, so I, I started the farmer's market, um, and that was my, my primary means for the first couple markets, you know, the first couple of weeks. And then from there, there was actually a restaurant around the corner, uh, word of mouth. You know, he, he heard about me and, and, yep. and went from there. And, and then... Uh, 
turned out that he, that restaurant was tied to two other restaurants. And then that guy was all networked and El Paso is a very small city. So once the word got out that there was a mushroom farmer, um, just about everybody knew, you know, all the, all the chefs talked to each yeah. other, uh, worked really well. Um, so yeah, that's how the marketing went and then the sales and distribution. Um, I'd like to share like how, how that went because it's, it's bloomed into something even better than when I left. Yeah. It, it's gotten better. Um, so it started off with me and Mario and Andre, or it wasn't even, it was Jose, my other mushroom friend who was growing shiitakes. So it yeah. started off with the three of us and, um, Mario was growing produce and then I was growing oysters and, um, Jose was growing shiitake. And we started off kind of doing like a little co-op to where we would rotate doing deliveries and we would, um, take turns messaging the chefs every week. Um, well, since I've left, it's now turned into eight farmers, yeah, eight farmers and 13 chefs. Wow. And they're growing all kinds of, you know, cayenne bravo radishes. There's one guy who just grows like 300 pounds of that. And there's one dude who does lettuces and microgreens and mushrooms. And, and they're all doing it as like one big co-op to where it's just delivered by one person, you know, and, and yeah. there's one, one invoice for all of these different farms. and you know, everybody's happy because you don't have to go running around. You know, there's not, there's not 13 people making deliveries um, yes. every week. It's just one person. So it, it really helps you focus on farming and not selling. Yeah. You know? So did you just pool your products? Did the co-op take like a cut off the top to keep that going or how did that work? Um, so when we were doing it, we were just taking turns. That's what, yeah. that's what we were doing. And then towards the end, we ended up just paying uh, hourly wage to one of, to, we were paying to, to Mario to just go out and do the deliveries for us. And he was more than happy to do that. Yeah. So um, that, that worked out really well. I'm not sure how they're doing it currently, but um, that's how we were doing it. And it worked out really well. You know, you, you pay somebody a couple dollars an hour or whatever it is to, uh, to do the deliveries and you can stay at home and farm more mushrooms and, and focus on production. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I wish more farmers would do that in the, uh across the nation because you're right there's no sense in 16 farmers making 16 separate trips around the city right yeah and you know you're talking about fuel usage vehicle wear and tear and just the most valuable thing of all time like you know yeah. you're always short timed on getting tasks done on the farm wouldn't you rather have somebody come by swing swing by pick it up and um, you know that goes down to competition like you know you don't don't come don't make a competition make it to where you're working together um, yeah. work, work together to where you can have different crops that are not in competition with each other if possible, you know, and just be friendly, like with, with local farmers. I'm, I'm very, very friendly, even with other oyster mushroom farmers in Wichita, I'll yeah. sell them blocks. I'll, I'll sell them spawn, you know, cause it's, there's a huge market. There's, there's more, yeah. there's, there's not enough supply for the demand usually, especially once you tap into all the farmers markets and all of the supermarkets and all of the, restaurants you know there, there's not enough supply more than likely yeah um so there's no reason to be all stingy and, and, and competition so, yeah yeah if you go into any whole foods you will say there's a new market right there <laughs> right right um yeah. the problem is their their food safety regulations and just uh yeah. product, um liability was mm -hmm. just through the roof because we tried to sell to them when we were upstate new york they asked us and they're like oh yeah sure mm -hmm. let's get going with just some microgreens yeah. and stuff and then it was like five thousand dollars just for the insurance for the umbrella insurance or whatever it's like yeah. a million plus dollars yeah. well it was and like they're gonna want it refrigerated refrigerated delivery and all of that and yeah and we don't like I, I plan on having that in the next year or two but you know 90 percent of farmers don't have that small farmers at least yeah um, yeah so that's a big a big stop right there yeah so what would you say the biggest mistake that beginning farmers make in the mushroom business? Probably taking on too much to where they start growing all the different colors of the rainbow rather yeah. than just focusing on the ones that are easier to grow or yield more. Um, so I would advise, you know, if, if anybody's starting to get into this is don't order 20 different types of spawn or, or yeah. the uh, liquid cultures or whatever. Just, just stick with a gray oyster or a blue oyster, like a white oyster. And then maybe if you want to do shiitake, do some shiitake because shiitake is actually really easy yeah. um, to grow in a sense of once you, it's all about incubation. Once you have it incubated, you just throw it in the fruiting room and the fruiting room can be all kinds of whack and it'll still produce decent shiitake. Gotcha. Um, 
so yeah, I would, I would advise just sticking to a core of, of quality mushrooms. Stay away from your, your golden and your, your pinks, although pinks are nice because they're, they're very forgiving because they're, they're so fast that you can spawn bags and they'll be wrong. Everything will be wrong and contaminated, but it'll still fruit. Okay. It's so fast and vigorous. But um, when it comes to actually producing on a commercial level, I would advise to stay away from those um, because the, the short shelf life, as we mentioned before, yeah. So pinks and pinks and golds, and they they taste horrible if you ask me. But that's a that's a personal opinion. Okay, that's so, good to know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. one thing you know, I'm thinking about when building your room. Is there a downside to using wood because it can get like spores in it, or and then you can get contamination, or does it not really matter? So you can use wood, but you're going to want to use the pressure treated lumber. Okay. Um, and the mushrooms are not going to contact it. So it's not, it's not like growing in a raised bed. It's not like yeah. growing in a raised bed where the soil is going to contact the, the chemicals. Um, so yeah, you can use pressure treated lumber. Um, and it, it typically doesn't contaminate, you know, I mean, you're, you're going to make sure that the grime stays off of it and, and you should be fine. So, um, but for the actual fruiting room itself to actually, and that would be more for the shelving is what a lot of people use the pressure treated lumber for. Um, for the actual room itself, you can use, plastic you know like poly walls like a greenhouse or yeah. you can use uh roofing like what mine is metal roofing yep. or insulated panels so there there's a lot of options for for building the fruiting room out of you know inert items yeah. that are easy to clean and and easy to wash and, and sanitize so yes yeah yeah absolutely very cool so being in the air force you get to travel a bit have you visited any interesting farms along the way yeah, so I, I actually just visited um, a farm in Cairo, in Egypt. Okay. So I had a I had a TDY to Cairo, and um, one of my patron supporters, uh, Khalid, he he reached out to me and he was like, "Hey, you know, when you're in Cairo, come come meet me. We'll go check out some mushroom farms." So we uh, we hit up a, a farm that was just outside of Cairo. Okay. And, um, and it was very interesting. So these guys grow, I believe it's mulberry. They grow mulberry outside okay. and they keep them short in bushes and then they use those branches. They'll break the branches off and put them in trays and they grow silkworms on that. Okay. okay. That's what they do in the summertime. So they, they'll take the silkworms and extract the silk and sell that. And then when they're done with that, they have these branches that are now stripped of all the leaves because the, the worms ate it. You know, the caterpillars ate all the leaves off of it. Yeah. They'll shred that down and sterilize it and grow mushrooms on it. Oh, and, wow. and, th and it's in the same room. It's in the same room that they were doing the um, caterpillars in because now it's in the fall time or in the winter time, it's too cold for the caterpillars. So they yeah. convert it over to a mushroom farm in, in the winter time. Um, oh, and then once those blocks are done, they send them out back and feed them to the worms. They have like a half acre vermicompost set up. So oh it's my like gosh. totally closed loop. They, they're really, I mean, if, if this farm was in the U.S., it would be toured all the time. It would, you know, if he, if he had a YouTube channel, everyone yeah. would be watching it. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, totally like closed loop or regenerative kind of agriculture. Um, he's been doing it for like, I think he said five years or something like that. Uh -huh. um, real inch. I have a video that I just put up about uh, the verma compost and about the, the, the farm. I didn't get to see the, um, the worms because it's winter time right now. So yeah. I didn't get to see the worm part of it. Uh, but that was, they brought out some of the silk, like the bags of the silk little pods and they were showing oh me that. Yeah. So it was, it was really interesting. It was, it was super, super cool. And I'm, I'm happy we we toured that particular farm. I don't think that there is, I'm pretty sure there's not another farm in the world that's doing that. There might be, but yeah, it's definitely one of the very few. So that's a, a really good, I'm glad you brought that up because I, it's always something I've thought about in the U.S. that I feel like we are so single use for everything. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And so I'm always thinking, how can we do exactly what these people are doing? I mean, it's four crops stacked. Um, yeah. So do you know anyone in the U.S. taking like old mushroom bo blocks and running worms through them? Is that something that's happening? It's very, uh, I'm sure that people are composting, but it's very common just to compost them. Typically gotcha. you just pile them up and compost them and sell them. Um, some people even sell like, Hey, come to my house and pick up a hundred blocks for 20 bucks or 50 bucks or whatever. Yeah. So not, not even composted because it's, they're, they're so, um, 
it's already crumbly. So all you do is just break it apart and put it in your soil and it just breaks down immediately. You don't really need to yeah. compost it a whole lot. I used to just till it into my beds when I used to farm in the backyard um, in El Paso. But um, yeah, there's, there's lots of use of, of the compost. We're definitely not wasting it or throwing it out. There, there are some farms that throw it out because it, it becomes so excessive. Like you're talking a yeah. dumpster full of it uh, a, a week for the, some of the larger farms. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, not everybody's composting it and putting it to use, but they definitely should. It's definitely a, a, a beneficial you yeah. know, thing for, for gardeners and farmers that they can use, use it to yeah. grow more crops with. So, well, you know, and, when we, and you can feed it to pigs too. Uh, oh, I know that like the, uh, the masters mix ones where they're made of soybean hull, yeah. soybean hull and sawdust. And then you have the, the mushroom one in there and made more protein out of it. And it's like a protein rich block, you know, it's like a mushroom. Um, so you, I know people that feed it to pigs or chickens and chickens will pick it apart yeah. and eat all the seeds out of it. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So when we actually farmed in upstate New York, we were about mm -hmm. an hour from Saratoga Springs, which, you know, has a racetrack and literally produces yep. mountains of straw and horse manure. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. that straw and horse manure was shipped like 500 miles down to Pennsylvania, which is the mm -hmm. mushroom capital of the U.S. It's turned yep. in the compost, run through the mushrooms, through it, and then actually was shipped back up and we would buy really? it by the tractor trailer wow. load for our fields. The mushroom compost, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, was, yep. it was incredible just the you know, just the, 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 how much trucking was involved. Yeah. Yeah. Opposed to just having a farm near yeah. the Kent Square that, that would use it, but it's so much. I mean, you got to realize how much mushrooms they're growing. They're growing like 10,000 plus pounds of mushrooms like a day. Yeah. You know, it's, it's insane. Yeah. Um, so that you got to think it for every mushroom, there's a, a hunk of compost that needs to be getting yeah. rid of. Um, yeah. 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 So let's talk about um, what are your favorite farming tools? My favorite farming tool, um, my favorite farming tool is probably the bagger that I invented uh -huh. because it saves so much time. And, and a lot of mushroom farmers um, that are starting out um, or don't have the equipment, they'll spend so much time. And I, I was there too, shoveling sawdust back and forth and, uh -huh. mixing it by hand and, and then scooping into each bag bag by hand whereas this thing you just step on a pedal and it just and it, what it does is it is dispensing pelletized soybean hull and pelletized uh, fuel pellets the sawdust and then water and it's all using knife valves so you step on the pedal and the knife valve switch and it dumps all the me measured content into the bag and then it it'll hydrate within five or ten seconds and then you fold and load it into the sterilizer so it turned like back in the day before I even had any kind of mixing operation and it was just a shovel and an IBC tote cut in half. It yeah. would take me about a, an hour and a half to do, I think it was like 30 bags. Yeah. Um, so, and then I made a, I made a mixer one out of a old Hobart meat grinder yeah. and that got it down to 40 minutes. Um, and now I'm doing 50 bags because I have a bigger sterilizer. I have a uh, 100, I used to have an 85 gallon. Now I have yep. a 110 gallon sterilizer. Okay. Yeah. So I'm doing 50 bags in about 15 to 20 minutes. Oh my so gosh. So it's, it's lightning fast. I mean, you could literally have probably four people working on the machine to keep yeah. up with it because wow. you got to fold and load them. And that takes a lot more time than filling it now because it only takes about two or three seconds to fill each bag. Yeah. Um, so I mean, that, that's my favorite. And uh, that the whole concept of dry bagging where you take the pellets and add the water, it just saves so much time opposed to batch mixing where you take you know, yeah. 200 pounds of substrate, add the water, blend it in, mix it up, mix it up, and then dispense it out. Um, while there are advantages to that, I really prefer the dry bagging method. It, it, it works and you still get great yields. You can still get two or three pounds per block, yeah. per 10 pound block, which is uh, you know, more than enough mushrooms for, for making the sales. Yeah. So, so it basically, you have each of them in a different like uh shoot coming in or is it mixed at the yes. top? Okay. So it's, it's, I have a, it's a split hopper where it has two sides to it. Gotcha. And there's a divider that runs down the middle. So you have the soybean hole and the fuel pellets. And then the water is kind of its own separate thing that comes in the side and gets injected very last. Um, and that's all PVC with the built-in reservoir. 
yeah. on the tank and I, and uh i could i'll sh shoot you the link for the video on that one in operation but it's it's lightning fast it's yeah um, i'd be one to i'm pretty damn sure it's the the fastest mushroom bagging machine available on the market right now without getting into the chinese like you know eighty thousand yeah. dollar crazy computerized um mushroom bagging machines very cool very cool that is uh that is, and how long did that take you? How many iterations did you have before you had the final version? Oh Lord! So just the valves alone, I think I had to make six different types of the valves. The hopper changed three times. Okay. Um, and then I had to. I'm going on my third manufacturer now, which is a different story. But yeah, so <laughs> I <had> another. <laughs> yeah. Finding manufacturers for small run items like this is really hard. Yeah. Um, that, that's a whole different conversation. But um, yeah, so it, it's constantly improving. Um, the last three or four units that went out had a, had a improvements to where it, they had sight windows to where you could oh, see nice. when yep. the material was running low. Um, I added a rack, an adjustable rack, depending on what size bag you're filling. So, I mean, it's constantly, it's con constantly developing, you know, new improvements and all of that. Uh, but yeah, d initially developing it, it took months. Um, it took, it took a lot of time, a lot of time and a lot of money. I, I, uh, I paid a company to do the CAD drawings for me and all of that. Yeah. So that cost a pretty penny. Um, and then I had it patent pending too. So that cost even more money. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been a lot of time and a lot of money, but it's, it's been doing well. It's been selling well. So a lot of people that have it, love it. Um, it's fast, you know? Yeah. So, Saving yeah. time. Saving time, right? Most valuable thing we have. Yeah. So where can people find out more about you and your work? Um, if you want to check out Myers Mushrooms or MyersMushrooms.com is my website. Yep. Um, and I, I primarily sell bags right now because I'm deployed. So my wife yep. is running that operation. Um, and then if you go down to the bottom of my website, I have all the different, uh, my Vimeo, I my, my Patreon.com if you want to support me, uh, my YouTube and then Bubba's Barrels. So that's the company that builds the sterilizers that I developed. Okay. Um, so if anybody wants to have a, a large turnkey mushroom sterilizer, they can hit up Bubba's Barrels and get it, get it from them. And um, yeah, it's, that's pretty much all the ways you can get a hold of me or, and you can always message me through my, through my uh, website. So. Yes. Yeah. And you might, we might find you just uh, lurking around the mushroom growing group is, which is where I met you. So. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So a mushroom growing Facebook group, I'm an admin there. Um, I think we just hit a hundred thousand members. Oh, wow. And, uh, we have, we have people from, you know, growing in five gallon buckets in their backyard all the way up to, you know, people with 7,000 square foot uh, mushroom farms. So it's a, uh, it's a good variety of uh, different levels of experience. Yeah. And, um, it's a, a good group of people. So very yeah. cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for coming on today. We appreciate your time and uh, best of luck in uh, hoping you are coming home soon. Thank you. Good talking to you too. Have a good one. Hey, Thriving Farmers, and that is a wrap with Eric. So next week on the podcast will be the amazing composter and soil builder, Carl Hammer. So Carl Hammer is always a fun interview, and kind of in this interview, I just let him go. I asked a few questions and guided the conversation a bit, but it's a fabulous episode. My favorite quote is he says, we don't make soil, we participate in mystery about how they do compost. He talks about how they uh, ferment all the waste that comes on their farm before they feed it to their chickens, and then it goes into their compost production um, process. Talks about how he got started, all about their mixes on the farm, how they do that, how they use different barks and different products to build out their compost. So you're going to want to join me. It's a great interview and one that I'm sure you'll want to listen to again. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.